1981, Portland, Oregon. Amidst the neon lights and digital melodies of Portland's arcades appeared a new cabinet, Polybius. The players were drawn to its fast-paced gameplay and mesmerizing visuals, but soon, reports of headaches, nausea, and memory loss began to emerge. Men in black suits were said to occasionally visit the cabinets to collect data. Then, just as mysteriously as it arrived, Polybius vanished without a trace, leaving many to wonder if it ever existed at all. Was Polybius a government mind control experiment gone wrong, or simply an internet fable? Welcome to Mystery Theories. I'm West, and tonight with my co-host, CJ, we'll be exploring the urban legend of Polybius. In the end, you'll have the chance to cast your vote and decide which is the most convincing mystery theory. Guys, sorry for the delay. We've been on summer break. And by summer break, I mean that we tried to record an episode and I fucked up the audio. So now we have to re-record it. Give me an audio test real quick. All right. I think we're good. I'm sorry I'm not perfect. Sorry I can't be perfect for you guys. Okay, have you ever made a mistake? Well, I did. You can say it was my fault for not monitoring the audio levels, but I, I'm going to choose to blame my crowd. CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike. Game CrowdStrike. <laughs> I, I thought CrowdStrike was a Final Fantasy character. Turns out it's a uh, controlling interest in, in every Fortune 500 company. So I don't know. This might this might be a little weird. But we got a... Goddamn. I made the PowerPoint presentation. Goddamn it. We're going to do the episode. CJ, today we're going back to our gaming roots. And we're going to unravel the mystery of Polybius. What's Polybius? <laughs> This is more excitement than your your genuine reaction to Polybius. So I like My this. Last one. I think I think the the actual one. You're just like, oh, okay, all right, what's up? So in the early 1980s, during the golden age of arcade games, a mysterious arcade game named Polybius began appearing in arcades around Portland, Oregon. Stories described a plain-looking cabinet with fast-paced gameplay, trippy visuals, and bizarre puzzles. Reportedly, the game began causing intense psychological effects on players, including nightmares, amnesia, and even seizures. Yet the game was said to be incredibly addicting. Adding to the intrigue, men in black suits were said to visit arcades to collect data from the machines. In terms of visual evidence, there's really not that much except for this screenshot of the start screen. So yeah, not, not too much to remark on this, just black background, there's a logo, copyright info, some credits. That screenshot kind of looks familiar. Why is that, Wes? <laughs> well, you might recognize the font from the game Bubbles. I guess one thing that's worth noting is that during that time, it was unusual to have a logo that was like that big and, and fancy looking on the start screen. That was something that Nintendo didn't really start doing until a few years later. It's because of all the uh, kilobytes of data that it's using. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it would take up too much RAM. So the name Polybius is derived from the name of an ancient Greek historian known for his works in cryptography and history. He's famous for saying that journalists shouldn't report on things that they cannot verify to be true. It kind of seems like it's a name that's picked specifically to, to troll conspiracy theorists. But at the same time, I hear that. And I'm like, if, if you're going to pick something for like a whatever government program, it seems like you would go with something that is meant to like stick the middle finger to conspiracy theorists. My, my question to you about Polybius, do you think he's wearing underwear under that? <laughs> CJ, why at that so, point, why bother? So Polybius was supposedly developed by a company called Sinus Lotion. Sinus translates to senses and lotion translates to like deprived. So it, it seems like it's a rough translation to the phrase sensory deprivation, but it's, it's not a very good translation. And this could imply that perhaps the creator isn't a native German speaker. I thought lotion implied what's next to your nightstand. <laughs> That's sin lotion. That's what, that's what Mormons call having uh, jurgens at the bed stand. So Polybius featured hypnotic, fast-paced visuals with brightly colored vector graphics that created a trance-like state for players. The game was also rumored to have subliminal messages and flashing lights causing psychoactive effects. But despite this, players found it highly addictive. The thing that always interested me about this was the, the unsettling otherworldly sounds. Like, what the hell could that be? Bjorn. Bjorn. Bjorno? Yeah. The pizza? Just, You're no. talking about the... the, the Bjorn. Bjorn. <laughs> Bjorn. <Yeah. laughs> it's the sound of Bjorn. Or the sound of Bjorn's uh, stalker blowing his brains out on a, on a VHS tape. You ever see that video? 
No. Oh, he didn't know about that. But yeah, this guy Bjorn had like a crate, like a uh, crazed stalker fan, and he like rubbed shit all over his p face and like blew his brains out on a VHS tape. Whoa. Yeah, that's like early internet days. And if you listen closely to Polybius, you might be able to hear Bjorn Stalker <laughs> Bjorning himself. <laughs> You're supposed to play it backwards. Yeah. You, like the White <laughs> Album. You can hear. <laughs> if you play it backwards, he comes back to life again. The Legend of Polybius gained significant traction when GamePro Magazine featured it in its August 2003 issue. The magazine included Polybius in its Secrets and Lies list, an article dedicated to urban legends and myths in the gaming world. So this article brought the obscure Legend of Polybius to a significantly broader audience, uh, many of whom had been completely unaware of the tale. And interestingly, they declared that the myth was inconclusive. This was like the big magazine at the time, or one of the big, it was yeah. this, this and like Nintendo Power. Game Pro. So it, Nintendo Power Game the, Pro. This was like yeah. a, a pretty big feature. That's uh, that's about the time like these game magazines started taking off for like teenagers and stuff. Nintendo had to combat uh, Game Pro's populace with a- Full frontal. With a yeah, full, full page spread of Mario. <laughs> In this urban legend, who has actually come forward to share accounts of this game? Well, really, there's there's two big names that come up, and one of them is a username. So a, a former Sega arcade programmer known under the pseudonym PRG017 came forward and claimed to have developed Polybius at Sega under the direction of a secretive organization called Sinus Lotion. The game, designed to stimulate specific areas of the brain, caused cognitive issues in testers. Now, he claimed that elements of its mind-altering code were later integrated into the Sega Genesis CD. And after accessing these files, he was laid off. And he believes the files were deleted. If you, you have to, I said this last time, you have to see the intro to the Sega CD. Shit's like fucking rotating and stuff. Yo, wait, you, at the end of this, we will shit. <laughs> okay. Is there, is there like a subliminal message in there? It like boots up. It's like, and there's for a second, it just flashes, vote Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, also there was Stephen Roach. So Stephen Roach, based in the Czech Republic, recounted his experience with Sinus Lotion, a company he claims he co-founded with other amateur programmers in 1978. Now, Roach claimed that they developed the game Polybius for a South American company. However, after its limited release, a boy in Portland suffered an epileptic fit while playing, causing panic and leading to the game's swift withdrawal. Roach believes Polybius could have revolutionized gaming, but remains a controversial and misunderstood project. But this makes no sense. Like A guy in the Czech Republic gets paid by a, by a South American company to make an arcade game that debuts in Portland, Oregon. And this guy, no, this guy's never been tracked down. This isn't like connected to, it's just a guy called Stephen Roach. No one can actually connect this to a real life person. That's not Jon Snow's friend. Is that a Game of Thrones reference? Wait, is there a Roach in Game of Thrones? No, I just thought Jon Snow. What's the dude that uh, fled the country in an airport? What was his name? Oh, jo uh, Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden, that's right. Jon Snow, Edward so Snowden. Tomato, tomato, tomato. <laughs> I love when you remember when Edward Snowden died in the seventh season and they he came back to life in the next one? What the fuck? They didn't even they didn't establish that at all. Death by arcades. Is it is it possible for video games to kill? In 1981, a boy by the name of Jeff Daly died after achieving a high score in the game Berserk. Also, Peter Bukowski, a year later, collapsed and died of a heart attack after playing the same game. By the way, also in the same city. That's what we should do an episode on. Like, that's a game we should be talking about. That Berserk has like a higher body count than I do. Do they give any names to people that died playing Polybius? Do they no. give any like that? So you couldn't find any articles for that? I couldn't find any. And we'll, and we'll get into that, that a little bit that's later. serious, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, also, there is Brian Morrow. Brian Morrow, he he played Asteroid. He set like a he was trying to set a marathon record for Asteroid. He played the game for 28 straight hours, consuming only Pepsi, and then he got really sick and like passed out. So yeah, and there's really no mystery there. If you drink if you drink nothing but Pepsi for an entire day while playing Asteroid, like you're gonna fucking pass out, or you're gonna shit your brains out, dude. I know. Get I, diabetes. Can, can you imagine playing insane. playing a game and like passing out and shit your pants, game. and then you wake up and you're in the newspaper, and now you're like famous forever, dude. dude and that's a thing it's not like he was marathoning a ton of fucking games he was literally playing, playing asteroid asteroids if i'm gonna shit my pants i want it to be for doing something cool like beating the the elden rings dlc yeah dude all i think of is the south park world of warcraft uh, mom 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 butt plug or butt, butt plug up that, well, that's what he should have had he should have had a butt plug <laughs> Butt plug that was stopped him from shitting himself there he would have fucking corked it out at fucking high velocity Scorched it out. <laughs> 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 All right, 
right, CJ. All right. Enough with the legends, enough with the stories, enough with the myths. It's time to get down to the theories. Theory one, government experiment. According to this theory, the game was developed by a secret government agency to test psychological and behavioral responses. Now, to justify this theory, I want to I want to establish a few baseline facts. And the first one is that the government has a history of utilizing video games in a variety of ways. A few examples would be the Bradley Trainer. So the Bradley Trainer was developed by Atari in the early 1980s, and it was a military project based on the popular arcade game Battlezone. The US Army was interested in using video game technology to train soldiers more cost effectively. And so they commissioned Atari to build this training simulator. Also, there's America's Army. Great game. Great game. Yeah, I played that one for the Xbox. I actually really enjoyed it. For what it's worth, I actually really enjoyed that, that game. But that's clearly like a recruiting mechanism. And then Call of Duty, I mean, enough said. If they try to escape to the mountains, there is only one road Tariq Al Mut, the highway of death. The Russians bombed it during the invasion killing the people trying to escape. These games, I think, are good examples of how the government used video games for like internal training resources, explicit recruiting mechanisms, and also more like passive social conditioners. Well, they also did it with Doom too, because they talked to id Software to have them build an army uh, simulator for Doom. Is that something you can download and check out? Yeah, yeah, they have stuff like that, yep. Okay, also, the government does have a history of using arcades as sites mm -hmm. to conduct intelligence gathering. So during the late 1970s and early 1980s, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies conducted sting operations in various arcades, including arcades in Portland, Oregon. During the early 80s, arcades were kind of like a center for petty crime. Youths would gather there and like smoke weed and steal and like get up to trouble. So the, the FBI was very interested in watching arcades. Uh, and so they would, they would actually put microphones and cameras inside of arcade cabinets in order to gather evidence. And also the, the US government does have a historical precedence for exploring mind control techniques. So the obvious one is MK Ultra. So MK Ultra, and we'll probably do a whole episode on this later on, so we're not, we're not gonna get too deep into it right now. I'm gonna kick that can down the road a little bit, but just high level, MK Ultra was a secret CIA project conducted during the 50s and 60s aimed at developing mind control techniques and it involved the administration of drugs, particularly LSD, as well as other psychological manipulations to test their effects on the human mind. So, so the government definitely isn't above pursuing mind control techniques. Uh, also, there was Operation Midnight Climax, which was a sub-project of MK Ultra. I only included this because I thought the name was funny, and I can make the joke that Midnight Climax is when you try to, <laughs> when you wake up in the middle of the night and you try to rub one out without waking up your wife. I was gonna say, is that what you do on a on a nightly basis, West? <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm more of a Operation well, 2 p.m. Climax guy. That's where that's when you work from home and you you uh, <laughs> try to, to get... do a sneak beat during a Zoom conference call. Thank you, B. Hey, Karen, I just don't think those figures are realistic. That is the funniest operation name, <laughs> Operation Sneak B. <laughs> operation Sneak B. <laughs> operation Sneak B. 20, 2016 was White Boy Summer. 2020 was Operation Sneak B. <laughs> Theory number two, corporate sabotage. Polybius was a ploy by a rival company to sabotage competitors. According to this theory, the game was intentionally designed to disrupt competitors by damaging their reputation and reducing their market share. During the early 1980s, the arcade game industry was intensely competitive. This era was known as the golden age of arcade games, and it was marked by rapid technological advancements and innovative game designs. Arcades became popular cultural hubs, attracting large crowds and driving companies to use aggressive marketing and secretive tactics to gain an edge. This high stakes environment could provide a plausible backdrop that Polybius could have been a tactic to discredit competitors and drive players away from rival arcades. Because one of the things that they, they noticed was that the, the cabinet was, whenever you see a picture of it, it it's reminiscent of a Namco style cabinet. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. possible, like maybe they, they, they could have put that out there as a way to like, just kind of pollute the zeitgeist of like Namco or some other company to like discredit those companies and, and like, gain a larger market share. So one famous case is IBM versus Hitachi. So in the 1980s, IBM claimed that Hitachi sabotaged 
their mainframe computers by planting faulty components. And this led to like a, a series of uh, lawsuits between the two companies. And then more recently, uh, Uber versus Lyft, there have been a lot of allegations of Uber employees ordering and then canceling thousands of Lyft rides to disrupt their, their services and, and data gathering operations. I would hate like if that was the actual truth, like the that's what it was, you know, because that means that people didn't care about the well-being of their customers. They just wanted to fucking get the more bang for their dollar out of uh, quarters from the little Johnny on the corner. Yeah, it would break my heart to, to find it would break my heart to find that a company felt that way. And finally, theory number three, Internet fabrication. Polybius is entirely a creation of the internet. According to this theory, the tale originated as a hoax or urban legend spread through online forums designed to entertain and intrigue audiences with its eerie and conspiratorial elements. Yeah, there's a few big points of evidence. One is that there's just like no historical record of this game at all. So there are these like comprehensive listings of arcade games from that period. And there's trade magazines, industry catalogs. None of them ever mentioned Polybius. In 20 years of gaming press through the 80s and 90s, there's not a single mention of the Polybius arcade game. Even if it was just like a trial run in, in, for one year, like you think there'd be there'd be some record of it somewhere. The earliest known mention of Polybius can be tracked back to a post on coinop.org, an arcade game database website from 1998. It had an entry on this website that came up sometime around the year 2000. So that there, there's no earlier, this is like the absolute like earliest digital footprint for yep. this game. The missing link for this case is like, if you can find anything pre 2000, that mentions Polybius, then that would crack the case wide open, but it's, it's yet yeah. to be found. Yeah, and even when you read the bottom of that too, it says in 2009, like they're, they were talking about it, about how that, that Stephen Roach is full of himself and knows nothing about the game. Now let's look at Kirk Collar. So Kirk Collar is the owner of coinop.org. He obtained the domain in 1998. Interestingly, he also added a German language version uh, about a year later. Now, Dan Amrick, the writer of the GamePro article, claimed that Kurt Collar was the one that tipped him off about the listing. This theory would posit that basically this guy made it up, right? He he got he got control of this website. He created the story as a way to like generate buzz for his new website, leaked it to the GamePro article, and then from there it just got legs of its own. He looks like Kurt Cobain. And he looks like Kurt Cobain. And you're really gonna trust a guy that looks like this? Well, CJ, those are just the theories. Uh, but which which theory do you decide? Uh, government experiment. There's a possibility because our government has in the past used different things to experiment. And then you talk about how the FBI was listening in uh, with cabinets and stuff. And it wouldn't surprise me. It could be something that the government was just trying to experiment with. When it comes to uh, corporate sabotage, I would hope that that wouldn't be the case that people in these corporations wouldn't alienate their their clientele by trying to get them to like throw up with their games so they uh go to play their actual game it's one of those things i would, I would hope that's not the case and then internet fabrication if you look at wikipedia internet fabrication is everywhere take whatever you read online to it with a grain of salt some some people are trying to get the truth out there and then some of them are you know trying to to troll people right like what a good uh what a good thing that they could do is like really mess with people so that's why i think that that's the one that's the one that sticks out to me the most yeah i think it's you know it's an interesting thing because i think that in terms of the government experiment theory every piece of that theory i think is true and has happened Yep. It just hasn't happened all in this this game called Polybius. What I think this is, I think this is like one of the earliest creepy pastas. This might be like maybe not the first creepy pasta, oh, yeah. but this could be like one of the earliest instances of, of a creepy pasta. Yeah, fair enough. Well, CJ, there's only one thing left to do, and that's <laughs> to play Polybius. Now, I'm not playing that. Motherfucker. No way. Mother I'm not fucker. doing it. Now, last time I sent you, I sent you to sinistlotion.com to download the game and you chickened out because you were afraid it's going to be a virus. Well, I downloaded the game. Did you? And All gonna, right. And I'm going to send it to you on Discord. So you don't have to worry about downloading it because I already downloaded it for you. 
you could still get a virus through a download that you get off I the I checked internet. it and it's fine. You it's fine. Son of a bitch. I got the link off a YouTube video. It's fine. CrowdStrike, CrowdStrike will protect you. I'm getting a warning right now when okay. I go to download it's, that. No okay. way. God damn it. No way. Fuck this. Fuck you. <laughs> We could always put on our uh, Discord a link to this, and if anybody wants, or in Ooh, yeah. the YouTube, and if anybody wants to try it on their own and isn't a giant pussy like me, go for it. I I play it, but I'm I'm on Mac, so I can't play it. It's all it's all EXE. Dude, that's what I would tell my friend when I'm trying to fucking <laughs> trying to I'm catfish. Trying to, all right, you caught me. I'm trying I'm trying to crowd strike your ass.